Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and today we're going to take you right to the middle of a men's conference in Erie, Pennsylvania. You'll get to see what really goes on at these men's conferences. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. And you know, life is an adventure. We at Deep Adventure Ministries, our creed is that the most radical quest you can have in life is to abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And I had a chance to go up and meet uh, with some wild men in a real wild place. I was up in Erie, Pennsylvania in the middle of February. They put me in a hotel right on the frozen lake. And it was just really, uh, it was stark. It was like, you got to be tough. you got to be a real man if you're going to survive in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. But it was also so beautiful. And I had a chance to speak with him. And I got to speak. This was Father Larry Richards' conference. And I was invited to speak there. What an honor and privilege to be with him and to be with those men. And by the way, we love you, Father Larry. We know that you just recently lost your, your mom. And we, we, we love you. And we, we, we pray for her, too. And I just want to say that... Uh, I know women would love to be a fly on the wall at some of these conferences. The very first event that I went to, the very first men's conference, was in Tampa, Florida. And guess who was my first speaker I heard was Father Larry Richards. And what was he doing? He was doing an examination of conscience, preparing the men to go to confession. And uh, there were several women kind of snuck in the back uh, where I was sitting, right as the event was starting, Father Larry's speech was starting. And they lasted about 15 minutes, and then they got out of there because he was blistering the men, you know, just really going through, getting real with them about things that they needed to deal with in their life. And, uh, and it, was, it was awesome. And so uh, to get to go to, to Erie, to his conference, and to speak was really something. And I know a lot of times, though, women would love to just be a fly on a wall and hear what's going on. And so you're going to get a chance to do that today because you're going to get to hear my presentation there. We're breaking it up into four segments. But I want to say something. You know, I'm Ukrainian. My, my, my grandparents had to flee the Ukraine when Stalin came in and took all of their wheat, not just their wheat, but the seed that they would use to plant the next spring. And so they fled to the Dakotas. That's actually where I was born. I got to go there last summer and go to the very place where I was baptized in Powers Lake, North Dakota, and see the actual baptismal font. It was really big. It was enough to hold a 200-pound man. No, it was just a little bitty thing. But, you know, when we go and speak uh, to these men, uh, women will come. When we speak to men's conferences or when we go to speak to conferences where there's men and women, the women will come up to Cindy and I, and they'll actually kind of corner us and surround us, and they'll say, Bear, you got to tell our men that we really want them to be men. We need them to be men. Now, there's a difference between men and women, and you can see it in the Ukraine. When the men are going to the border with their wives and their children, and they're giving them that kiss goodbye, and the women are being so brave for the sake of their children, they're smiling often with that, with the smiling through those tears, trying to be brave and keeping the uh, the children happy and helping them to feel safe. And the men kiss them goodbye. They kiss their children goodbye and then they give their wife that long last look, you know, of, I'm going to come back and we will see each other again. And they go back and what do they do? They fight. So women have this valiant role and men have this valiant role too. And the men go back and what are they fighting for? They're fighting to provide, a, a, to be able to provide a place, you know, a shelter, uh, a castle. Uh, to build a wall of protection around their family so that their women, and a big wall of protection, so that their women and their children can flourish. You know, the Lord said, I will expand your walls. I will build a hedge of protection around you. And that's the role of men. Uh, the role of men as a leader is to protect and to provide a place for the women and the children and the others that they have kuleana for to flourish. You know, we need men to be leaders. That doesn't mean we need men to be bosses. Leaders are in the front leading. They're not in the back pushing. You know, King, King Saul was a mule herder. You know, and mules are known you have to push them and force them to, to go where you want them to go. King David was a shepherd. He led his flock. 
that's how men need to lead. We don't need macho men. We need men who will lay down their lives in service, servant leadership, have an ear to the Holy Spirit, and be able to say, this is the way. Follow it. So right now, get ready. You're going to tune in to the beginning of my talk to the, Peri to the Erie, Pennsylvania Men's Conference. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're taking e you into the Erie, Pennsylvania Conference right now. Prayer group back in the olden days, the Wild West days. And they would cry out, Viva Cristo Rey. It's the cry of the Cristeros. Do you know about the Cristeros way up here? It happened only a little over 100 years ago down in, uh, in Mexico where they, uh, where they shut down the churches and killed uh, the priests and desecrated the sacrament. Could never happen here, you know, although it seems like maybe that's possible. Um, and so their cry was, long live Christ the King. So that became our call on Long Ride Home. That's the EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home. So you guys want to do that with me? Viva Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Probably got to stand up, I think, to do this right. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! All right, thank you guys. You can, you can sit down now, but thank you. Can you imagine, as reading the Liturgy of the Hour today, the psalm talk said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That's how, you get, that's how you get into the door, is by being thankful. And like Father Larry says, to say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You know, I got off the plane yesterday, and Chet met me there. And I told him, I haven't been this cold since I was in Moscow three years ago. And I almost got stuck there. We're on our way back from Israel. Almost got stuck there. But uh, so I kind of manned up. I'm here in Lake Erie and just so glad to be here with you guys. Uh, where are our young men? Any, any men that are uh, 30 years of age or less? Let's see you stand up. Where are they? Stand up there. And, and where's John? There's John in the back. Brian's son. Oh, thank you. Thank you. The, the, you guys, we are so glad that you're here. And we need for you to, uh, to be bold and to man up, stand for your faith. I know when I was younger, when I was confirmed, the bishop slapped me in the face. And he said, be prepared to defend your faith. So we're especially glad you guys are here. Especially glad you're, you're here. So you can, you can sit down. You guys can have a seat. John and Brian are going to hand out some, some uh, sign-ups if you want to sign up for my email and my newsletter. So you can just pass the papers down and back like you used to do in school. That cry, um, call to the wall. Some of you guys have heard, uh, well, the Knights of Columbus have the Into the Breach uh, um, talks that they do. And I haven't seen those, but I know they're supposed to be really awesome. Uh, we're, we as men, people will go, well, you know, we've been relegated. We're, we've been emasculated. We... Uh, you know, the women have taken over and, you know, we're just, you know, um, you know, we've just been kind of uh, sublimated as men. We don't have a place anymore. And I just want to go use the real words, BS, because that sounds like a victim to me. Oh, poor, oh, poor me. We've been relegated. The reason why you see this, this, uh, this, the, the, the men being, uh, relegated to and being marginalized is because we let it happen. And we need to start stepping into the breach. We need to take our, stand our ground. We need to take back the ground that we gave away. And I'm not saying that it isn't great what has happened with women and how they've come more and more into their own. But men, we let all, we let this uh, attack on us happen. And we, and because, and we just decided we would just take the punches. But we as men need to stand up and be men again. I, I get on on secular shows and, and, and Christian non-denominational shows and Catholic shows, and they go, this is Bear Wozniak. He's going to talk to us about uh, masculinity or about, you know, masculine spirituality. And I go, no, I'm not. I'm going to talk about manliness. You know, it's time for men to just stand up and be counted and say, we're men. And, we, and, we, and we're, we're made by God uh, in a very special way. Uh, to be providers and protectors, to be servant leaders, to lay down our lives, to stand be between the vulnerable and the danger that may be there. And, you know, I, I look back at the, this whole woke culture. It's a very effeminate thing. You know, and you go back to Humanae Vitae. When, uh, when the pill came about, 
men said, oh good, I can have sex and I don't have to have responsibility. And I remember John Paul II, I think his first book was Sex and Responsibility or Love and Responsibility. Men just kind of took the back seat. Oh, I can have sex with her. I don't have to be committed to her. And, uh, and, uh, and um, the family, the key, the key part, the key element, as Aristotle said, uh, it, it, of, of the whole uh, world is the family. I hope you're enjoying listening in to the Erie, Pennsylvania Men's Conference. I really love going out there and meeting real men. You know, they're committed to each other. They bring their brothers, they bring their sons, they bring their friends. And that's, that's what evangelization is about. It's about friendship. It's about brothers being brothers and reaching out to each other and say, hey, you've got to come. You've got to participate. If you don't have a men's conference in your area, start one. If you don't have a men's, a men's group in your local parish, start one. And we'd like to also to invite you to go to Bears Man Cave, uh, deepadventure.com, and you can join the Man Cave and the School of Manliness, which is a three-year cycle of, uh, that we go through together as men. And uh, you can also have your son sign up uh, to go through the School of Manliness with just you. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel the Boone Markham with another episode of Country of Fear. Years ago, during the midnight of my soul, I considered ending it all. My pain was serious hard to bear. Two things kept me going from self-propelling myself across the Grim Reaper's Bridge to Eternity. Concern for my children, and two, well, number two was the fear of God. When the love of God doesn't convince you, the fear of God will keep you. I loved my daddy, and my daddy loved me, but it was a healthy fear of my daddy that kept me from doing wrong. The prospect of my daddy's raw hide, meaty hand applied to my posterior was a mite troubling. I didn't fear daddy. I feared his hand, and that was a good thing. He never injured me, just applied the right amount of motivation where it was needed. I enjoy God's love daily, repeatedly. It feeds me, it comforts me, it warms me from harming myself and others and keeps me out of trouble. His rod protects me from the enemy and disciplines me while his staff guides and rescues. Folks don't like hearing about the fear of God. In fact, enlightened folks, so-called, think such fear is primitive religion or superstition. Folks like the shepherd's staff that rescues, but not so much the rod that is to be feared. Yes, fear means awe and respect, but it also means fear. Daddy's discipline only needed to be applied now and then. One episode left a lasting impression. Yet I had his companionship, protection, provision, and love every day. Isaiah prophesied that Christ would delight in the fear of the Lord. Since Jesus did so, seems to me we should be mindful of doing the same. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're taking you back to Erie, Pennsylvania, to the men's conference that I spoke to. There's Father Larry Richards and his men there that I spoke to in the middle of February. And I got to meet some great men. Uh, I, love, I love it when I go there because I get so... I came back from that men's conference so determined and so right with God and so um, 
with such a perspective on what my role in life is and what my ministry is and how how to uh, to move forward. And that's what these conferences do. My theme of the talk is the 300. And the 300 I'm referring to are the 300 members men of Thermopylae, the Spartans. And I've been right there where that battle was. And also I've been to where Gideon fought with his 300 men. It doesn't take a lot of men to make a difference. It takes two or maybe three to start a local men's group. And uh, if you don't have a big conference in your area, why not get one started? You know, don't look around and wait for someone else to do it. Take some leadership and go for it. And if you want to know how you can do that, go to deepadventure.com. And we have a, uh, the man cave that you can become a part of. It's a, it's a community. We don't, we're off Facebook because we had one of our pages canceled there, although we're still on with our other pages. But we have a forum for men, and we also have the mama bears for the women, where we can uh, share with each other, challenge each other, inspire each other, encourage each other, pray for each other. But also we have the three-year school of manliness, a curriculum that takes you through uh, three years, month by month. We all go through it together. And uh, men, you can actually have your sons sign up and you can lead them through it. So we're taking you into the men's conference in Erie, Pennsylvania. And someone asked Archbishop Chaput, what's the key to evangelization? And he said, get married, have a family, raise them in the Lord. That's God's plan for evangelization. But the family has been decimated, and it's our fault. Because so many men just, and, the, and right now, the sweep left, sweep right thing where, where the people are planning on hooking up, you know, before, uh, if, they, if, they, if they don't get, a, get to have sex with a girl before the third date, they think they're being teased. You know, when I was in high school, a long time ago, if we dated a girl and we were kind of making out or something like that and she didn't put out after the third date, I wasn't like this. I really did respect women. But people would say, oh, she's just a tease. You know who the biggest teases are in the world? Are men, especially the younger men. They'll date. They don't even date. They'll, they, they go out to the youth group or they meet girls. They don't ask them out on a date. Then they do ask them out on a date and they don't, uh, they don't ever ask them to marry them. Or they don't get engaged till the second child's on the way. And so, so many men now are just, are boys. And people introduce me and go, oh, this is Bear Wozniak. He's a real nice guy. And I go, no, I'm not. I'm really not. I, I hope to be a good man, but I'm not a nice guy. You know, in Waikiki, we have some challenges sometimes now. There's kind of an invasion of the homeless from the mainland, and they're not homeless, they're thugs. And, we, and I have to step between them and the vulnerable time and time and time again. It's time for us as men to, sta to stand our ground. And where's Pete? Where's my friend Pete? Where is he? He's probably, he was in the back earlier. He is teaching, I think, 10th year religion class. We as men, that's not, it shouldn't be just the women that are teaching catechism, that are teaching confirmation. We need to step into the breach. You know where the breach is, by the way? It's right through your living room. So we as men, we've let it happen. What, what a, you know, people go, well, we just need to do, the church hasn't done its part. No, you haven't done your part. You are the church. So Nehemiah, you know how, hey, John, where's John? Where's my friend John? Brian's son. Hey, John, do you know who the shortest prophet was in the Bible? Nehemiah. <laughs> Nehemiah. Do you know where baseball's mentioned? It's in the first verse of the Bible. In the big inning, God created the heavens and the earth. You don't. And motorcycles are mentioned too. David's triumph was heard throughout the land. But Nehemiah, he challenged the men. He came back to uh, Jerusalem and he challenged the men there. What, I've been got, you know, we were in exile for 70 years and you've let the walls of the temple fall. You did it. And he challenged them to rebuild it. And the way they did it, if you read Nehemiah, it's kind of boring really in a way, but it's a powerful statement. It reads, this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. And this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. And you go 20, you go a full clock around the, the walls uh, of the temple of Jerusalem. It, it's a man and his family that rebuild the church. It's not the priest. It's not the bishop. And stop blaming it on them. It's you. The breach runs through your house, and you need to rebuild the wall. And you do that how? Servant leadership. You love on your wife. My, my wife gets a flower just about every other day. There's still flowers this time of year. <laughs> Why? We go, we go for coffee. We pray the liturgy hour together. I don't want to spoil her so it's not every day. But how do you love on your wife? How are you showing you? How do you do that? 
Do your children see you in the morning when they kind of wake up a little bit early? Do they see you having your, your prayer time? You know, are, they, they, are you the ones that's getting them? I know my kids, when they were young, I used to have to throw them in the jacuzzi on Sunday morning, four of them, scrub their hair, throw them in the car. Two of them went to the bathroom, get the other kid, get them back in, getting them all to church. You know, there, I know you know the statistics, but I, I think it bears repeating that there, there's a t- statistics quite a few years old now by the Pew Research that when a woman is the leader in the family, when she's the one that get, goes to church, about a third of those kids will remain uh, going to church. When a man and a woman go together, it goes way up to up into the 70%. But here's what's important. When only the man goes, o- over two-thirds of the kids stay in the church. Men, you have a role. Don't let it, don't, don't, uh, don't just step into the void and leave a vacuum for a woman to have to do. This whole woke culture is, I look back at, you know, it's, 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 it's the feminization of America. It, th- this gossip cancel culture is how women treat each other. That's how they fight, right? With gossip. And I'm not, and can- men, men stand up. We, we're not afraid of, uh, we, we're risk takers. Women are risk averse. That's what they do. They protect. But we've just kind of said, let, let take our liberty, liberties. You do it. You women do it. And I'm going to watch football with my friends. But you have a vital role and you're anointed to do it. There's nothing more powerful than a man with his family. But the, when they were rebuilding this wall, how did they do that? The men would work together, but then the, the, the attack came. As you begin to work, you know, people say, when you're on Long Ride Home and you're filming that TV show, do you suffer, do you come under spiritual attack? And I go, never, because we're on the attack, right? The, Satan comes under attack, not us. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Well, gates don't attack people, right? You're on the attack. I forget the general, the Spanish general, uh, that back in the day when they were fighting uh, the Muslim invasion, and he had, they, were, they were more and more cornered up in the mountains in Spain. They say he had cuts and bruises all over the front of his body, but not on the back, because he, he was on the attack. And so as you begin to stand up for Jesus, there will be, uh, you will face resistance. And that's why you need your brothers, like Chet has his prayer group, and Jesse has his group of men. Throughout the year, you need to be together in small groups. What Father was talking about, the heroic men, you need to, you need to have brothers. You know, maybe you just have a small group of men, five or six men that you group text every day. Um, but you need to have a, a band of brothers, because when they came under attack, what happened is the man carrying the supplies would have his sword drawn and carry the mortar or, the, or whatever it was to the men that were repairing. And the men that were working, there would be a brother standing there with a spear and a shield protecting him. And when there was a problem, they would, they would blow the ram's horn and everyone would come running to that area to help. We need to stand together. That's why I love what you guys are doing here, you know, the, men, the men's conference, the men's movement. It's time for us to stand up, step into the breach, stand our ground, and take back the ground, not that was taken from us, that we gave away, that we yielded, like little girls. I was in uh, Greece, you know, following in the footsteps of St. Paul, and uh, I went to Thermopylae. You know Thermopylae? Where's, where's, where's John? Does John know about the 300 Spartans? You know about the 300 Spartans, John? There was, a, there was a breach. You know the story, that breach in the, in, the, in, the, in the wall. I forget what it was called now. But 300 Spartans fought uh, valiantly for several days. Uh, and they, what's that? He knows it. Uh, and, of course, who are the 300 in the Bible that we know about? Gideon's army. How many men do you think are here today and watching on virtual, probably around 300, maybe a little bit more. Don't underestimate yourselves. I, I love this new thing. One of my guys is going to do a meme of Jesus on the cross. I've seen this saying, did you just underestimate, underestimate me? That should be interesting. Don't underestimate yourselves. You know, that you're a small band of warriors. You remember when David, love King David, you know, he's hiding out from King Saul. King Saul's trying to kill him, and David doesn't want to fight him. You know, he's, he's his leader. And, uh, and uh, King, da- King David, is, you know, is hiding out in the cave of Adullam. Hello? 
Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak coming to you from Waikiki Beach. I have a beautiful memory uh, when my mother passed away, and I'm kind of remembering this because right out here, the tradition in Hawaii, when someone passes away, for people to go and honor that person with a paddle out in the outrigger canoe. And my dad and my family were all paddled out, and we said a prayer, and we all dove into the water, just splashing the water in the air and saying, we love you, Mom, in honor of her. But I remember when she died, my mother and father's favorite song was Wind Beneath My Wings. When you went to their home, there was a, a in the north woods of Minnesota, the, all these back windy roads you had to go. You would follow the flight of a wooden eagle in the trees. It would show you which path to take. And when you got to their land, it would say, those who wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings of, as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. There was a sign that said that when you went into this home. And my dad be, had become a deacon in the Catholic Church. And presidents of corporations would come and he'd lead them on spiritual retreats. And when my father became a deacon, they played the song and they had Israel Kahana Miko Ole singing it, uh, Wind Beneath My Wings. My mother was like that to my father. And when we, I heard that my mother was dying, I flew and she was in a hospital in St. Cloud, Minnesota, overlooking the Mississippi River. I brought dozens of lays to lay across her bed. And uh, I opened up the windows in the early morning and a bald eagle came and flew in a semicircle next to her room, only eight feet away. And right at the same moment that my, the rest of my family walked in. And as the eagle sailed away, my mother's breath just dropped. And within a few moments, Although she had been unconscious for several days, we heard her go, oh, 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 and then she died as she saw the beatific vision. God is calling us to fly on eagle's wings, to abandon ourselves to his love and to long for the beatific vision. This is Bear Wozniak with DeepAdventure.com. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak, deepadventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict Exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak. We're bringing you back to the Erie, Pennsylvania Men's Conference. Had a chance to speak to a lot of great men, both uh, live and also virtually. And we want to invite you, go to our website, deepadventure.com. There's a button up there that says subscribe. And subscribe to our email newsletter because that means every week you get an inspirational uh, roar from the cave by me or by one of the men that's in the man cave. And you also get this video version, the video version of our radio show, and you get that uh, sent to you actually uh, before it even airs on, uh, on Saturday evenings in your area on, EW, on the EW10 network. So go to deepadventure.com and subscribe to our email newsletter. It's good stuff. And who, who was in the cave of Adalim? People running from the law, people who owed money. Maybe they're running from their mother-in-law too, I don't know, but a bunch of misfits. And what happened in the cave of Adalim? The same thing that's happening here. The men formed each other. The Holy Spirit formed the men. And they became the mighty men of valor. So we have, to, we have to form each other, challenge each other, encourage each other, inspire each other, pray with each other. Think about uh, Jesus and what his reputation is right now. You know, Jesus said, if you're hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll... I will explode, vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus has a bad reputation. I think most people, I mean, every time someone dies, they go, they're in a better place. Maybe not. Maybe not. If Jesus was here today, people think he would be at Starbucks uh, doing a poetry reading, you know? 
Like, why can't we all just get along? You know, the way you get, the way you uh, grow together is by both people pursuing truth and being open to, to hearing and learning, but truth. People think that God is malleable. You know, when you, when you give yourself over to pornography or premarital sex or your own selfish agendas, you're uh, seeking wealth or power or glory, when you do that, you have to relegate God. you got to put him on the shelf because, you know, God's a real personal God. And you ha but you have to put him, I mean, he did die on the cross for us, you know, because he loves us. You keep relegating him and relegating him, uh, uh, and you're given over to a reprobate mind. But Jesus, God isn't like that. God said, let me get this one thing straight. You're the clay, I'm the potter. And there are times in your life, I've, I've been, I lived in New Mexico, Mexico for a couple of years. I learned about how they make pottery. You know, they, they get the clay and they, they, get, they mix it with water and they pound it. Anybody feel like they've had that experience with God? Where God's just working you and softening you and making you more pliable by the adversity and challenges in your life. And the water too, right? The, the water of the Holy Spirit, the grace and love of God. God wants to form you. But I know when they, they throw that clay on the wheel, it starts spinning and then the potter puts his thumbs down. And it pro, you know, think about our heart, it probably hurts. But he makes, that into, he makes us into a vessel. And I know like in the old days, if you go to old museum, the, the, the vases told stories like the, of a great war. And that's what God wants to do in your life is make you a story. But first you have to let him be the potter and you be, be the clay. You need to get up on the altar. You know, uh, think about, uh, I love uh, Jacob. Do you know the story of Jacob wrestling with God in the desert? You know, Jesus is the biggest, baddest bouncer there is. You know, there ain't no way to get to the Father except through him. He's the guy at the door. I mean, he wants you to come in, but you got to go through him. When Jacob was in the desert, this, the angel of the Lord, they call it a theophany. It was Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ. He started fighting. And, you know, one of my favorite things to do is knife fighting. I, I think it's funny to knife fight. Not a real knife fight. I don't want to do that, but just training, you know. Because when you're in a knife fight, you have the advantage when you don't have the knife because you've got all these weapons and he doesn't know what you're going to do, but he only, he has a weapon and you know that's where the attack's going to come from. And uh, one of the things you do in a knife fight is you close distance as soon as you can, right? You don't hang out on the fringes, but you give him the target. You know, you might be fighting, you're going to maybe give him the target. If you have your hands here, he's probably not going to hit here or here. He's going to come here. So you stage the fight. So you know where the attack is coming from, <laughs> and you know where it's going to go. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? He staged that fight. And Satan came, he said, I got this weapon, it's called death, and I'm going to kill you, Jesus. I'm going to kill you. And Jesus said, did you just underestimate me? <laughs> and he staged that fight. And when, when Satan attacked him, they fought and fought and fought. At some point, he just dropped his hands, and, and he allowed... Uh, he, he allowed uh, that attack, he allowed himself to die. But there's an old song by a musician named Carmen that talks about that fight. How, at the, how everybody's the demons and the angels and everybody's watching and, and Satan and Jesus are duking out. At some point, Jesus just drops his arms and Satan slays him. And then uh, God the Father starts that countdown. You know that countdown? One, two, three you know, tell the count of 10, then they're out. Only God did it this way. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And Jesus rose again. You know, he's, he is the champion. He is the victor. But Jacob's out there wrestling with God. How many of you are wrestling with God about something in your lives? The key to that is to close distance. So when, you're, when you see someone trying to fight Muhammad Ali, they grab onto him, or, or Tyson, they grab onto him because the punches don't hurt that bad when you get in close. If you're feeling a little bit of pain, maybe you need to close distance with Jesus, hold on to him, 
And, 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 and what, did, what, did God, what did the angel say? To, say what did Jacob say to the angel? I, when he was clinging to him all through the night, tumbling in the desert, I won't let go of you until you bless me. So if you're, if you're in that knife fight with Jesus right now, close distance. You know, let, cling to him. Say, Lord, I'm not going to let go of you. You know, Jesus was like that. He would push people away. You see it in the Gospels several times. He would push someone away to see if they would come back, to see if they, their response would be how badly they wanted to come to him. And so think about what the knife does too. The sword of the Spirit in uh, the Garden of Eden, right? It protected. Uh, no one could go into that garden without dealing with that sword of the Spirit, that flaming sword. No one gets to go to heaven without going into a sword fight with God. I mean, think about this. Mary, her heart was pierced. That circumcision, that surgical circumcision that we have, to, that she, she, she was pierced by watching her son sorrow. Jesus was pierced. And the church was birthed. God wants to do surgery on your hearts and circumcise those things that cling to you, those things that, you know what my biggest problem is? One of my biggest problems, I'll confess, and Larry, Larry, will, Larry will, Father Larry, is, is thinking that the ministry is my job, is, is my response, my kuleana. You know, that it's, God's, that God's not in control. I gotta work really, really hard and then maybe everything will turn out right and I don't, I have to trust the Lord for his will to be done. We think it's all up to us. Um, and so as God does that circumcision in your heart, so it'll dilate. So you have more, of, more, uh, more light coming into your heart. So if you feel you're in that, in that, uh, in that uh, surgical room with the Lord, don't get up and leave. Let God have his work with you. Think about, um, think about Moses in the desert uh, on Mount Sinai and uh, the burning bush. It's not a flaming sword, but there is a flame there. And God says to him, Moses, what are you holding in your hand? Where, where, where's, uh, where's John again? I want to ask him. Hey, John, do you remember that story of Moses and the burning bush? And the, do you remember what he had in his hand? She shepherd's staff. And what happened when God told him to throw it down? Came into a hissing snake, like a really angry snake. And then, you know, I'm from the Southwest. We have rattlesnakes there. Uh, and uh, if anyone ever told you, pick up the snake, pick it up by the tail, we would know they're probably from Ohio. They're probably not from around. So Moses goes, uh, hey, God, you're probably not from around here, but you don't pick up a snake by, by its tail. And, uh, but he did. And so when you're clinging to your life, men, and I know some of you, you've given your life to the Lord, but you kind of want to keep taking it back. If you're clinging to your life, Jesus said, if you try to cling to your life, you're going to lose it. If you lay down your life, you'll gain it. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus, you have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak.
Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're taking you into the talks that I gave at the Erie, Pennsylvania Men's Conference where we're, we're challenging men to be men. Uh, we, need, we need men to be men again and not to apologize for their existence and not try to, f to find yourself uh, squeezed into a, a, a fainter and, and narrower corner. But we need for you to be men. And what it means to be a man is to be a leader. And what leaders do is they serve. What leaders do is they're out in front on the vanguard of the army leading and showing them the way and showing them direction. One of the ways that you men can show your family direction is to have that morning prayer time. That when your children get up early or your, or your wife uh, is getting things ready or she's going to work or getting things ready for the children, that she sees that you've already been up and, if you, and you've had your 20 minutes of prayer or maybe your half hour of prayer. As Father Larry Richards likes to say, and I love it, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. So you have to spend that time in the morning. And you lead by example. That's what I'm saying. You be the one to get to lead the children and to bring them to Mass. You be the one that gets them to catechism. You be the one that uh, at the dinner table leads them maybe in a discussion. Uh, maybe read that, that, that day's gospel and lead them in a discussion about uh, maybe what they can learn uh, from that and dialogue with them. And one of the greatest ways you can lead as a man is to join Bear's Man Cave in the School of Manliness. And you can have your sons that are confirmation age or older have their own login. They're not allowed to be part of our Man Cave. That's just for grown, grown up adult men. But we do give them a, a username and password so they can get into the School of Manliness. And then you can actually track them. You can go through the lessons with them. There's about six or seven lessons. Some are video, some are audio, some are written. Uh, and even there's a self-assessment that they can take. And you can dialogue with them once a week or once every two weeks and lead them through the School of Manliness and also watch as they prog progress through it with you. Here we are. We're going back to the Erie Men's uh, Conference in Erie, Pennsylvania. Whatever you're clinging to, whether it's your job or, or I don't know what it is, whatever that is, it's a hissing snake. Well, for Moses... It was his career, right? He was a shepherd. It was his identity, too. It was the way he provided for his family. But as long as he was large and in charge, it was a hissing snake, and he, he threw it down. And then what, then what happened, right, is God said, okay, Moses, now pick it up by its tail. That's an act of faith. Sometimes when God tells you to throw it down, it stays down. It needs to be there. It needs to die. But there are some things in your life that God wants to bless, but as long as you do it on your own, it can't be filled with his resurrection, glory, and power. So throw it down. And then if he says pick it up, maybe not now, maybe weeks, months, years from now, <clears throat> then pick it up. And the rod of Moses then becomes the rod of God. So God's challenging you. To, he wants to, you know, in Hawaii, when you... We haven't talked about surfing, have we? Let's see. Let's just talk about surfing for the next... I got 16 more minutes. Let's just talk about surfing. Uh, in Hawaii, when you paddle out, you leave the aina behind you. You know, that land where the cars are coming and buildings are being built and things always change the temporal world that we live in. You turn your back on that. The first lesson is to turn your back. The first lesson is detachment from everything that you've been clinging to or clings to you, and you paddle out. And surfers paddle out. Where I surf, it's about a half a mile out. My mom says surfers, my mom used to say, she probably still does, surfers are the, are the sentries. We're out there and we're looking. And we know the seasons. I know not to paddle out in Waikiki in the winter because the big surf's on the North Shore in the summer, the big surf is in front of my house. We know the seasons. We know the swell direction is coming there. And I know that that reef will catch that swell better than that reef. And I know the wave intervals. I know maybe it's 13 seconds or maybe it's 40 seconds. I know that the sets are maybe eight minutes apart. I go out and I wait. But I've studied my catechism, right? I know, I know my, I know, I guess is what I'm trying to say is I know my season that I'm in. I pray the liturgy of the hour every day, you know? I'm receiving the sacraments that then we go out and we wait. And then we, when the wave comes, we paddle with all our might. You don't, don't catch a wave without paddling hard. And then you abandon yourself to that wave. When my son Jeremiah towed into a 85-foot wave, 
he, he knew more than likely he wouldn't live. But he had been training for that his whole life. And he abandoned himself to that way. But when you do that, when you really do that, uh, you're in God's hands. And that's what God wants for us. It's just to abandon yourself. Let the knife, let the surgical knife do its job. I got to be at Mount Carmel, you know, where Elijah, uh, you, know, where, you know the story of Mount, you know, the Super Bowl is, way, is, that t is that this weekend? Okay. So it was the Super Bowl of the gods on Mount Carmel. You know, uh, the old god of abortion, Molech or Baal, uh, was, uh, was who the king's wife worshipped, and he, Ahab worshipped him, Jezebel. And all of Israel was kind of wishy-washy, kind of like Father Larry, a little bit wishy-washy. Don't know where he stands. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> First time I ever saw him, it was when he did, I did the examination of conscience, and I was <laughs> like that. Uh, but... On Mount Carmel, this is the decision we have every morning. He, call, he challenged the priests and prophets of Baal about 900, I think 950 or something like that all together, 900 or so. <clears throat> and he said, you build a big old pile of wood, which is what we are, wood, hay, and stubble, right? Our, our, our fallen nature. And you call on your God to send fire. And when you're done, I'll call on my God. And whoever God sends fire wins. Pretty bold thing for him to do especially considering that Molech and Baal were the god of fire. You know, they used to throw their children into the fire. And uh, so the priests and prophets of Baal, they're very sincere. You look at the darkness around you, and you see the false prophets. You know, we know what it is. We know the culture around us that is full of false prophets. They're very, very committed. They're very sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. And all day long, they're, they're shouting and dancing. And then finally, it's not working. And this is what... This is what Elijah does. Elijah stands up and he goes, so where is your God? I mean, it says in the nice English translation, has he gone aside? What that means is, has he gone to do number two? You know, totally insulted them. And they go, oh no. So now they start slashing their wrists and they're dancing and, more, and no fire ever fell. And then Elijah said, okay, now let's build a big trough around my stack of wood and let's pour water on it now there was a great drought for many years so the water probably came from the sea down below you know this i would say you know, as a surfer probably had salt in it if you never surfed in the ocean you know it has a unique taste it tastes like salt so i think about the blood sweat and tears the, uh, of people the tears of people and in, in, in your own life you put that all on the altar to god and say god make this make sense somehow and he called on God, and fire fell and cons burned everything, consumed everything. And the priests and prophets of Baal, Elijah slew them. But before, before, before I'm sorry, I should, I should have said this first. Be before he called on fire, he said, choose this day who you will serve. If God is God, serve him. Guys, our life is so short. You know what's really tough with my radio show? I know someone listening is probably going to die that day. You know, that's how many, you know, that many people are listening. It's, it's, it's serious stuff. There's men here that may not be here next year. You know, our life here is so short. Make it mean something. And, and surrender all to the Lord. If God is God, serve him. You know how you serve the Lord? When my dad became, in his late 80s and 90s, he said, I don't have a ministry anymore. He was a deacon. I go, Dad, you have your most important ministry. Our, our first most important ministry is to minister to the Lord. That's why Catholics are so awesome. What is Mass? We don't, get, we don't stand up and clap our hands and have, get entertained. We're focused. We're worshiping. We've entered into our gates with thanksgiving. Man, you think, at least I have this challenge. In the morning, I want to get up. I got work to do. I want, I want to get to work. You, you think that's the most important thing. I got to provide for, for my family. I got to work. But you know what? I love the liturgy of the hour. My dad t turned me on to it. All the priests, you know, and nuns and deacons. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of Catholics do. And it's, in fact, I'll tell you that in a second. But doing the, doing the liturgy of the hour, the word liturgy means the work of the people. If you're a man, that's your work. The liturgy of the mass, the liturgy of the hour. Do your job. Minister to the Lord first. Go to him and spend time with him. You know, I, I, I was kidding yesterday, but you know, these, 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 
these early church fathers, they plagiarized me, especially St. Augustine. He stole some of my best thoughts. As I was thinking, as a surfer, even on a foggy, on a cloudy day in Hawaii, you can get a suntan. You know, it pierces through. And sometimes in your prayer life, you don't feel anything. You're doing the liturgy, you're reading the Psalms, it doesn't even seem to have anything to do with you. You don't feel the presence of God, but you, you're putting yourself there in that sunlight and you're getting a spiritual tan. And when you know, St. Augustine stole that from me. I read it a year after I thought I came up with it. But uh, give, you, give yourself, you know, first to the Lord and ask yourself the question, who will I serve? If God is God, serve him. If, if, you know, if you're your own God, serve yourself. But choose who you will serve. Uh, thank you for letting me be here. I'm going to give you guys one thought, and that is um, about our School of Manliness, if you want to check it out, because we have the Liturgy of the Hour there. But I want you guys to stand up one more time. Where are all of our young men again? You want to raise your hands? All right. Choose this day who you will serve. Viva Cristo! Viva Cristo! Viva Cristo! Come on, Tom. Viva Cristo! <laughs> Aloha. Thank you, man. Aloha. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our DeepAdventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.